Who's your backup? You want to turn this on? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Is there a power on? Okay. It's good um, to start with technical stuff, right? <laughs> I do it. Um, what's what's important is to start everything with some fumbling. It is important. I do that well. <laughs> so everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is the very first uh, podcast of Trees Talk, and I'm very happy to have Jim Fanvu here, um, who, who whom I'm a huge fan of in a number of ways. Um, I really, you know, this conversation can kind of go anywhere, I think. Um, but maybe I'll ask a question first. I, I guess one of the things I'm really interested in, I, I came to know your work through your comics. And I will say that I find them seriously hilarious and some of the best comics that I've read. So Thank you. you're welcome. There was no money exchange for him. There was to say no that. money exchange, not yet. Um, so, so, I, so maybe I'm just, I'm just curious to know if you don't mind, maybe. I'm just curious how you got into them, or I mean, was it something that you've always done, or maybe you could just talk a little bit about that, how um, that developed. Let's see. Um, so I've always been into drawing. I mean, that's something that all kids are um, encouraged to do when they're young, like through grade school. Mm -hmm. Like there's always like some art component to their curriculum. Yeah. And. I feel like I just kind of had a knack for it, but I never really did it seriously till I was in my 30s. The uh, comics you mean, or drawing? Yeah, uh -huh. comics. Like, I never really drew. It was only if I had a flyer for a show, like a music concert, that I would draw a flyer. So maybe we should be clear, so that, that music was really, is your was your first serious practice in terms of yeah. being a creative? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, that was sort of like what was valued in my family. I see. Artistically, music was. How, how so? Do you mind unpacking yeah, that a little bit? Sure. There was a piano in our house. There was a guitar in our house. Piano lessons from oh. the age of five through high For, school. Forcibly? Yes, forcibly <laughs> through tears. My mom's a piano teacher, by okay. the way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but through, I get it. Through tears, <laughs> sometimes crying because TV is so important when you're a kid. You don't want to be doing these scales. Um, no, I hate I hate practicing. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, practicing something that you don't have like natural inclination towards that is actually something that's tedious and onerous is just like completely joyless. Like, right. For a kid, like. Yeah. There was no escape in it for me. There how, was. How How long did you take lessons? From five to. 18. 18 was My the year man. I could quit. <laughs> wow, so that that's that's a long time. Yeah, and I don't have the chops to show for all that time. I, well, I, listen, I, I, in, I don't have any chops, and I should. <laughs> believe me. Yeah, yeah, it was it was in your blood. Well, you were um, the scion of, of piano. <laughs> yeah, my mom tried. Um, so okay, so, yeah, so but but do you think it created a framework for for music as a as a way of life though despite that or, or not because of that at all um yeah I mean music was well my parents were immigrants they're Vietnamese immigrants um, and they came here in 1975 well, so yeah I think for a lot of immigrants like there is an incredible work ethic yeah. but also the notion of the American dream where if you work hard at anything then you can have you can have it yeah as long as you put in the work. Did they buy into that, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe it's different now, but I feel like, I mean, they came here in the 70s, and there was, mm. a, like, a lot of leftover. I mean, yeah. there was war and chaos, but, of course, there was also, like, they went to San Francisco, where there was, like, a lot of that sort of, you know, free-spirited mentality. So that's where you grew up. Yeah, yeah, that's where I grew up. Okay. Yeah, so um, there was that notion of, like my mom was like pretty progressive and she was artistic herself even though she never was like a professional at it meaning like she didn't mm -hmm. ever she was never paid for yeah. that, those pursuits yeah and my dad was a writer and like he was never paid for those pursuits but they were what things, kind of writer he would write essays and poems and like oh. political criticism uh, for his, just for himself you mean or for himself or like Vietnamese publications oh. yeah, yeah. So Lo like local ones or, or I, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. have no idea. Right. It, was, it 
it was hard, but I mean, but like I would see him on like Vietnamese talk shows, like local Vietnamese uh. talk shows, and he was just like a political sort of talking head or just like someone who was like a personality yeah. that they wanted on. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like me now, right? You're definitely personality. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say, I mean, I mean that in the best way, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I would want. I'd rather be a personality than not a personality, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. you? I don't know. Do I get to be super beautiful? <laughs> you are super beautiful. What are you talking about? But I mean, like beauty, a, be- a, a quiet beauty. <laughs> like there are those beauties where it's like, Shh, no, please. <laughs> not touching that one. Um, I could, you know, <clears throat> I I think we might have been separated at birth though, because because you have a real, you seem to have a very New York kind of sardonic quality. But although you didn't, but you lived there, right? Is that true? I lived there because I thought that, like, my type of personality, like, sort of neurotic and kind of, like, this energy and just sort of big ideas and um, just, like, um, the way I talk sometimes, that I would fit in there. Right. But when I was there, I was like, oh, it's exhausting. All these people, like, talking all the time. <laughs> I've never, you know, it's interesting. My parents are both from New York City, but I never lived there. Oh. I've never lived there, and I always thought that I would, but I ended up here. Yeah, it's never too late. Life is long. <laughs> it's long. I don't know if I actually want to live in New York that much. I don't know. Or would you like to go back? Yeah, I have a dream. Is that right? Oh, yeah, tell me about your dream. When I was in New York, all I wanted to do was for one season. <laughs> um, Right. <laughs> yeah, I wanted one season, one summer, where I could just sit on the subway and draw, like, women's mangled feet from, like, all the crazy shoes that they wear there. Wow. Their, their feet would just, like, contort into these permanent shapes that I was fascinated by. But you can't, like, really stare at people's feet because that's too fetishistic. So, like, I would just, like, sneak glances. But if I had, like, I don't you didn't know. Take, my... You didn't, weren't tempted to take pictures, though? I think I was too exhausted and angry, oh. like <laughs> as a New Yorker. <laughs> okay. I was I was so tired there. I felt like I was like always on a treadmill. Every day I was running, like the whole time I was there. I mean, I learned a lot. But, yeah. Um, so after two years, I was were there. you were you doing music full time there? Is that no? No. I mean, I did music as much as I could as a hobby. I mean, yeah. like it's always been a hobby. Like all my art practices don't generate income, so like right. I've always had like a day job. Me too. Full time. Yeah. So, yeah, but your day job is in your field. That's true. And it informs your work. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on when you, when you talk to me. I mean, no, it does. I'm kidding. I mean, it, it does. It does. But, well, but I, I, so I guess one of the things I'm really interested in talking about is doing, having a multiple practice mm-hmm. life in terms yeah. of artistically. I mean, I guess I have lots of questions about it. One of them is, is, is does one does your music practice dominate over cartoons or, or do 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 they kind of take different do they take prominence sometimes one over the other depending on what's going on? Yeah. So like from the inception of uh, me seriously drawing, like uh, with focus and intent, um, it was because I lost my voice when oh. I was in my thirties. It was like a long period of time. Wow. And so like my voice is like my main for yeah. composition. Right. So I couldn't use it and because I was rendered mute pretty much. Right. Like there was a lot of like stuff that would normally be expressed like on a sonic level that I had to find some sort of different channel ah. to force it into. And drawing was something that kind of like came naturally even though I never did it with intention before. Right. So then I just started doing that. So did it happen kind of casually? And then it sort of became... Yeah. You, uh-huh. Yeah. It started casually just using, like... Drawing straight away, not necessarily cartoons, just drawing in general, or... Yeah. Also, it came from, like, this... Like, I have a bad memory sometimes, and sometimes I have, like, really intense um, experiences with friends that I just think, I wish I could remember this forever. Yeah. yeah. So it was a way of documenting those things so that they wouldn't slip away, kind of like right. a dream. Right. Right. Like, you don't write it down you're not really gonna remember when you were doing that at that point were you also using writing and text or 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 not so much yeah it was always language based right because it was always like the way i like tell stories has always been rooted in language like so with music it's lyric based songs right like with cartoons it's 
you know, the interaction of characters talking to each other. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things about your cartoons that I think is, I, so like, I'll, I'm just thinking about like one of my favorite ones, which is, okay. which is the, you have plague, you have, it's the, the, the pandemic one. Oh yeah. Because I, here's the reason, I mean, aside from, I think it's hilarious. Okay. That fucking happens to me <laughs> in my, in my garage. It happened to me like 10 times. Mm hmm over the last two months. Wait, how did it happen? But it happens garage? because because I, I you know, never had a parking garage before. So, you know, I, I have a nice parking space. Let's and set it up for whoever is watching what this cartoon Okay, is. so the cartoon is... You, you set it up. Um, <laughs> it's your cartoon. So in the cartoon, there's two people walking, passing each other on a sidewalk. One is walking outside the cars. One is walking on the sidewalk. And they both have thought bubbles that say, you got the plague. <laughs> So it's like a friendly interaction, yeah. but the unspoken notion is that, you know, let's keep, let's keep this distant. Right. So, so the interesting thing is like the description of that isn't necessarily hilarious, but what's, okay, so let me tell you what happened to me first of all. Okay. I, so that happened, that's exactly what happened to me okay. is that I kept somehow ending up at my car at the same time as the guy next to me. Oh. Every, like seriously, like five times in three days. Yeah. And it was just coincidental. And it was like, how you doing, man? How you doing, man? Oh, good. But you could just see the fear in his eyes. I don't actually have it because I had already had COVID. Yeah. So I don't necessarily have that much fear. Yeah. But, but just You've his... You've got a shield. I kind of have a shield. But, but his fear made me feel the same way anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess here's the thing I like about the cartoon is that it's the drawing of the characters that really brings it home. There's something about, like, you've got this kind of slouch of their shoulders, and I don't know, you pick the view of them kind of, like, turning away from each other. Mm -hmm. You pick the, you know, this is going to sound weird, but when I talk to my students about um, figure drawing and narrative, I often, talk, I often show them Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. And the reason I love Rembrandt as a narrative artist mm -hmm. is because he almost always picks the best gesture mm -hmm. that's most poignant compared to his contemporaries, like, for, you know, like, for religious scenes. Mm -hmm. So... And it's not that the other painters uh, from that time aren't really great, mm -hmm. but somehow he gets the one that gets you in the heart, mm -hmm. or gets you, you know, really... So, that's what your work does. Is I mean, he good at drawing hands? He's very good at drawing hands. Well, he's good at drawing everything. Oh. <laughs> but, but... I'm not good at but drawing no, hands. But, <laughs> but Jem, you are good at... And mean, I can't draw crowds, <laughs> forests, or rice. Well, there's... <laughs> A lot of what individual you, what, things in a group. How, how do you know? I, okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> so you know that you can't draw those things because you've obviously tried. Yeah. Because you want to draw them? Because I'm a master. I know what my limits are. <laughs> so, okay. Are those things that you've wanted to draw for your, for your work? I think that like when you're starting out, you're, you're just going towards your impulses. Yeah. And like, Oh, this happened. Let me draw a bowl of rice. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, look at this ditch of eraser ink. It's not going to get there. Um, I see. But then, then you start finding your inspiration in places that don't involve a bowl of rice or a crowd or uh -huh. a forest. Yeah. So you find out where your strengths are. So if, okay. So if you, let's say you had a cartoon where you needed to draw a bowl of rice, would you decide to not do that cartoon? It or? would be like an elbow <laughs> in front of some, <laughs> like at the top of a bowl and some steam. Yeah, but, okay, but, but you would make it readable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think your work is, is serious, is extremely readable. Oh, thank That's you. That's the thing about, I mean, it's, like I was reading the, I think I posted the one with the cat, the cat core, the army cat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's something about the eyes of the cats in the background that <laughs> kills me. I don't, I mean, I, you know, it's in a way, I, I, analyzing jokes, you know, David Foster Wallace wrote this really great essay on Kafka about why Kafka is hilarious, but why Americans don't get that, oh. because it's not an American sense of humor. And then he talks about how he feels really guilty talking about this in the classroom, mm -hmm. because the easiest way to empty a joke of its joy is to try and like <laughs> analyze it. Yeah. He said it's kind of like trying to figure out why a flower smells good by dissecting it, you kill it. Yeah, you know but, what I mean? Yeah, but it takes a while for the flower to bloom, right? There's like the stem, the leaves, like right. the bud, and you know, all that. Are, the roots, are you the aware dirt, that, the area. Yeah. Are you aware that your work is really funny when you make one a good one? I mean, I know that's a weird question. That's kind of putting Yeah, I mean, that's like the, the like spark that I'm trying to, like the little firefly that I'm trying to like screw into the jar, right? Mm. Like I see the firefly, I'm like, ooh, that's a good one. Uh -huh. But as like... I don't know, with um, 
with anything that you're you're like a, you have a craft towards that fades quickly as you become like the carpenter that yeah is. that's a good point so it's like I what, what do you mean can you, can you expand yeah, that yeah so like you grab the it, impulse or the inspiration like you do the sketch or yeah. like you lay down the skeleton of the song or whatever mm -hmm. but once you start filling it in you're just like building the framework you're doing the rebar yeah. <laughs> you're pouring concrete you're doing the drywall right yeah. but yeah. then hopefully the structure of whatever you set out to do is strong enough so that it conveys it to mm -hmm. whoever your audience is do you find that do you find that in the middle of making something like whether it's a song or a cartoon or whatever that things radically change from your vision or do they tend to not yeah they do not sometimes not radically but i mean mm -hmm. it's different for each each thing that yeah. i'm pursuing yeah some of them come quickly and they're exactly what i pictured yeah some of them kind of like meander in a way to find a different sort of outcome mm -hmm. like the route to the destination is yeah is different yeah i'm curious to uh, the video of yours that I posted, I can't start, I don't remember the name of the song, but... Hope, hope Beyond Scope. Yeah, that's a great title. So, I'd be interested to hear about how that song was created and how the video was created and what the relationship is between them. Okay. Do you mind so, it? no, not at all. I never get asked these questions. Am I supposed to ignore the camera or, like, acknowledge it? You can acknowledge it. Is there a fourth wall or not? I, I mean, that's... I. I don't care. <laughs> Whatever you like. <laughs> I okay. do care. It's not that I don't care. It doesn't. I'm. I'm good with either. Okay. So <laughs> for that like. one, um, my upstairs neighbor has a piano. I was cat sitting. I have like access to various instruments through my talents at cat sitting. So I was there just banging around. Sometimes I just kind of play um, improvisationally. Yeah. Like I pretend I'm Alice Coltrane. I'm not. Right. But then sometimes certain chords will solidify and like um, resonate and reverberate in yeah. a way that it's intriguing and yeah. it has it holds my attention. Yeah. And then I just play those chords over and over the sequence. And usually it's minimal, two chords, three chords. Mm -hmm. Any more than that, jazz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is which is off limits, right? No, we don't want that. Verboten. <laughs> jazz is verboten. <laughs> So that We're happens. Gonna get some angry letters. No, I'm kidding. So you zone out on that. Yeah. You get into your trance. And then that's when the lyrics huh. will start coming. Okay. And then the mm. lyrics come. And then all of a sudden, the air will sort of paralyze. And you go, oh no! I need to write this down. Okay. And you need to find something quickly right. to write it down. Right. Because that's the yeah. moment that's been condensed that yeah. um, happened for that. That's interesting. And then you write down the chords before you forget. You put it on your voice notes on your phone before you forget the rhythm yeah. and like the sequencing and like the melodic line. And then you write down the words quickly. Right. And mostly the words are a sketch and then you can always change it a yeah. little bit. And mm. then for that one, once I put it into the recording program, it ended without like a solid, conclusion so then I added more at the very end uh -huh. like through what I was listening to objectively at the time it's all subjective and you're just kind yeah. of like downloading from your paralyzed <laughs> airspace that's a really good description I know exactly what you going mean on. like I almost feel like I'm being puppeted yeah and then 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 that's when craft comes in when I have it and I can listen to it objectively and say it needs this that that word needs to change this melody is a little weak here i could improve that yeah but the initial like impetus is almost like a convergence of different energies yeah totally i mean it's really i mean it's a really very articulate description of a combination of instinct and mm -hmm. rational analysis mm -hmm. right i mean yeah. that's really what you're saying yeah um, what you said. <laughs> well, no, okay. Well, I mean, you know, it also, it, it reminds me of something, I don't know if you know Philip Gustin's paintings, because I no. bet you would like them. Because, Probably. Because, anyway, we'll talk about them soon. Okay. But he said that every painting comes down to a crucial, like, five or ten minute period where mm -hmm. it kind of just what you said mm -hmm. happens happens to him probably in his own way mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you work on a piece for an hour or for a hundred hours mm -hmm. it's still a ten minute window when it all comes together oh 
I believe that. No, it totally is interesting. Yeah. And I have found that to be true. There are some exceptions in my practice because sometimes I'm a fucking maniac and I work on pieces for five years. But, mm-hmm. um, but I think it's really. It, I think when you really are trying to sew something up, mm-hmm. that's, to me, that's like, it's the finishing of it. Yeah. That's just a fucking killer, man. <laughs> I, I, I really it's like it's like it's, it's the same as sports like trying to finish or trying to beat somebody mm-hmm. at something where you're up mm-hmm. but just closing it out mm-hmm. man you can lose it so easily yeah at any point at any point yeah, yeah. um have you have okay that's another question I have do you so I not I don't really want to talk about myself so much but this is relevant I lose a lot of patience mm-hmm. is how I describe it yeah I really do mm-hmm. and and you know I think a lot of artists need to destroy works in order to make the other ones mm-hmm. but then i know people who just seem to just crank the shit out oh they just they're like they're like batting a million yeah and i just don't fucking understand how they do it but what's your well okay so it sounds like you are also self-curating well like, my, my nickname in grad school is the terminator <laughs> for destroying my work so i'm really i'm notoriously yeah. bad about that so meaning like you care about what gets public publicized or what's what you put out in the world you don't want but in my case stuff. but in my case it's nothing to do with the world is that i despise it i can't i, <laughs> wow. I can't even think about it going out in the world oh, i just well, hate I, it i get that i despise many things that I make. <laughs> but it doesn't stop you from making them um, or putting them out well okay i the joy is in creation for me sure like i like to make stuff it's the telling uh, the telling people that i made it uh-huh. but putting a price on it right, and right. asking people to pay that price for these things is really difficult. Is it, is it, is it, fe- so, okay, no. It's crippling. <laughs> so, so, and then, you don't have to get into this if you don't want to, but yeah. I am very curious to know if you know why it's, like, what is it about the, it, maybe it's more than one thing? I think it's that it's so, like, the stuff I make is so personal. Yeah. And it, like, uh-huh. draws from personal experiences. If it was, like, I don't know, cultural or political commentary, or if I didn't put myself in the things I made, Yeah. And if I was objective from the start, where I didn't feel like, oh, this is my story, yeah, or these are these are the things I would like you to know about myself, then I think I could be like twenty dollars. <laughs> so is uh, so, so here's what I'm I'm actually I'm interested in this because I before my I'm full you know you know I was in recovery from super depression anyway um, I felt exactly the way you feel. Mm-hmm. I really, I mean, not exactly, but very similar. Mm-hmm. I don't feel the same now as quite, though. I'm not sure why. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious to know, what is it about money or transactions? Like, is, I think it's my lack of it. Like, I put it out there, and, like, the transactions aren't enough. <laughs> you, you, mean, you mean, practically speaking, in terms yeah. of you're not, you're not getting paid what you think you're worth? Which, uh, which yeah, I, I, I think, think you're so. worth a lot, by the way. Thank you very much. I'm serious. Thank you. I mean, I, it, yeah. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> the amount of time that I put into okay. things um, aren't being compensated in a way that I would feel like, uh, like encouragement to continue. So, I feel like the encouragement to continue is all spiritual and yeah. emotional. But in a capitalism, if it was financial, that'd be great too. Yeah. That's the structure that we're operating. That's true. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've come to a new idea that, that they're not, in my mind, they're not as separated as I thought. Mm-hmm. Which I'm not sure why I think that because I'm not, it's not because I'm getting anything more than I got before. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, so maybe, I'll, so maybe I'll, I'll talk about myself for a second because yeah. I think, so I'm not saying this is you, but I'm wondering if it's a little bit you. I wonder if you could um, tell the audience um, what you you are my name's it's a good point who you are and what you do and why you want to have these conversations okay that's a good point my name's joe beal and um i am an artist a visual artist um and i'm also a teacher i I teach at cal state fullerton and the reason i want to have these conversations i mean i I, first of all love my solitary practice i mean i definitely value it Mm -hmm. but i've always wanted more than that i think and um you know when i was in uh I was also an art history major, and we studied uh, particularly like the abstract expressionists and, and Black Mountain College. And for mm-hmm. some reason, the existence of Black Mountain College, which was this really communal place in mm-hmm. the fift- 40s and 50s that, mm-hmm. you know, John Cage was teaching there and Joseph mm-hmm. Alba, all these amazing people. Yeah, there was an exhibit at Hammer. Yeah, I know. That exhibit was incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I always admired that place, even though I'm not really a commune kind of guy. 
Well, maybe I am now. I don't know. I'm still not. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, is like, it like the enclosure of a commune? Let's not get into it. It's pretty much everything. <laughs> it's like the free lunch. Uh, that part I could handle. Um, <laughs> or, or at least discounted love. Um, is it the vegetarianism? That's part of it. For sure. I'm a recovering vegetarian. Um, no, I, I, think, I think it's, I, in serious, I think it's the, I think it's the connection and community thing that I do need and I never admitted it. Anyway, um, so when I was in recovery, I, I was like, wow, I would really like to talk to not just artists, but people, mm-hmm. really about like kind of two things that are really key. Mm-hmm. A, just what brings people joy, mm-hmm. which, I mean, these are kind of large, gooey headings. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm from California. Uh, yeah. I know what that means. No, I know. I like Let's it. Let's get into the goo. The goo, Yeah. And, and also the things that they struggle with. And, but I don't mean you have to bury your soul and, you know, have a confessional, like, you know, psych... psych- hey, I'm Catholic. I know all about confession. <laughs> well, I'm Jewish, so, I mean, we, I think we both have lots of guilt. We, that's... I think, I think that was... So, yeah, I, I, I think that... What I learned in therapy was that naming things is sometimes the key to healing, not mm-hmm. analyzing them, mm-hmm. not... Just literally just naming it. So when you're talking about getting your stuff out... Mm-hmm. I totally can relate to that. And I, I wonder, though, if there's a weird feeling. I think I, I, in the past, have felt very weird about my personal soul being out there and being commodified. Like, I think I resent the commodification. Yeah. Yet, here's the part for me that was really fucked me up, mm-hmm. is that I secretly wanted it badly. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't admit it to myself or yeah. others that I really wanted to be a capitalist superstar. Mm-hmm. So what I did was denigrated it in a very snobby, kind of, like, bitter smart-assy way, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of intellectuals and particularly academics do. Mm-hmm. But I kind of call bullshit on myself mm-hmm. on that. Whereas I actually don't think they're at odds. I think they, they are maybe at odds philosophically, mm-hmm. but they don't need to be. And I, I tell you who the person that kind of I rethought about is Philip Glass. Mm-hmm. And there's a really amazing film about Philip Glass called Philip Glass in, in Six Parts, which it's hard to find now. But he is somebody who has remain absolutely doggedly personal Mm -hmm. and incredibly capitalistically Hmm. successful and he has not lost a single you know karma point Mm -hmm. in my in my opinion Mm -hmm. so i don't know it's interesting to me i'll have to watch that yeah it's not digitized it's not no you know it it is i you know it used to be free on youtube Mm -hmm. and i used to watch it like in I think the last time I saw it was maybe 2013. Mm-hmm. I showed it to my class. I showed pieces of it to my class. But now, man, you can't find it. It's mm-hmm. like, you, I, I think I found it's a DVD for like $150 because it's out of print on Amazon. Oh, wow. He's very protective of his copyright. Mm-hmm. He's, he's extremely protective, mm-hmm. actually, to the point where it's hard to find things sometimes. Oh, he like wants it, to get paid for it. Well, he does, and yeah. I don't blame him, man. Yeah. I really don't blame him at all. But, but anyway, um, so I guess I wonder if, like, I guess my question to you then, it's a little bit of a hardish question, but, mm-hmm. like, if you got super, super stardom, do you think you would still feel the same way about the yeah, commodification? Yeah, of course. You, you, <laughs> I think I would. You wouldn't trust it. You wouldn't like it. Yeah, I okay. mean... Well, that's the, interesting. I think, like, the great thing about, like, everyone having their own channel and being able to express all their failures as well as their successes uh-huh. is that you can follow your heroes and they're complaining all the time. <laughs> that's you know? true. Like, there's always something that bugs them. So right. it's like, I could be, you know, Sia, a beautiful pop star. Yeah. But, you know, she has, like, she's very transparent about her depression and, like... So is Rihanna. Wow. Riri? <laughs> I didn't... I, you're closer to her than I am, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a nickname basis. I am Instead of Jem, she calls me J. <laughs> If you're on, yeah, if you're a single, yeah, if you're on a single letter basis, that's pretty <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, so like people who are at the top of their game have have their own problems too. It's like no matter but, how much you progress, you're trading your set of problems for a new set of problems. But even the way you said that, which I, which I mean, it's interesting. You said they have their problems too, mm-hmm. but that sentence kind of implies a surprise that they would have problems. Yeah. But I why? Mean, why is it surprising? That okay. So, like, if we're taking, for instance, Instagram as like our model, sure. like it's like a highlight culture. Like people put, you know, pictures of themselves, like having a good time, like walking through the park. But then we talk to them, and they're like, "I'm so depressed." So it's like, yeah. it's not like a full picture. Maybe that contradicts what I just said. No, no, but, I think like, you're right. But um, even if it contradicts it, it's still. <laughs> yeah, I think it's. I hold both opinions. No, I mean that's part of 
the way it works, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, no, I hear you. I, I get it. Um, yeah, so that's why I think from the time I grew up where media was so, like, narrow, and there was so, it was limited. Like, people didn't really have their own voice. They had, like, their team of people yeah. saying this and this and this for them. Right. But now they can just go on tweet or, like, write a rampage on Instagram or whatever, and then all of a sudden you are inside their heads, and you know what they're actually thinking, and yeah. you know what their, like, psychoses are. I mean, the interesting thing I find, it, one, of the, one of the many interesting things I find in your work is that it's very transparent about what, about your things you're jaded about, sarcastic about. Like your, I mean, like, I'd, I'd be okay. interested to hear you talk about your cat, your relationship <laughs> well, with your cat. Okay, well, what do you, can you, like, yeah. um, anchor it to a sure. particular panel or Okay, a like, or okay, yes, there is the one where the cat is, it's, one of them is the yoga one. Where okay. they, I, I think you're doing yoga, or oh, yeah. and the cat's commenting on your. No. Oh yeah. yeah, no, these are real life problems. No, these are I all, know. These are all autobiographical. They're yeah. not like. Yeah. It's very like nonfiction. These <laughs> cartoons are nonfiction. No, I, I, that's what I, I love live, about them. Okay, you know how like, <laughs> in quarantine, there's like, people splitting up, and there's like, rising domestic abuse. Me. But with my cat, I'm the abused. <laughs> You're the abused. Oh, yeah, no. I, 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 I was working from home for like a long time, and like it was just like this really like dominant, <laughs> dominant submissive. But you could, but yeah. you could put the cat out, couldn't you? No, because I live in such a small space. There are no doors. No, I mean you could just like. He's not outdoor. If he no, no, no. I mean, you could just disown the cat. Oh, you mean like rehome him, like to the outdoors? Well, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> that's not what I would call it, but okay. Rehome him to the streets. I, I would never do that. I'm no. kidding, but, but I mean, okay, no, go ahead. Keep yeah, going. I no. mean, if you have, okay, so I, it's pretty much me and this cat in yeah. my house. So yeah. it's like a very, and I have a wild imagination too. So like, if you're. Like cats only say one thing. They say meow, right? <laughs> or they say <laughs> or yeah. so maybe they say a couple things. But um if I'm just alone by myself, I'm not talking to people, right? It's just my cat. So it's like, okay, you're I'm communing with you. Like you're you don't want me to do this Pilates instructional <laughs> video. Like how, you're, you're how do you sit. know that how do you know it doesn't want you to? Like how Okay, does, I roll out my mat. Yeah, I wanna hear this. Like the zoom goes on, the zoom is like hi teacher. And then I start doing my poses, and then the cat decides to wake up from the nap and be like, now's the time. Yeah. This is it. And then just like, either plants himself on the mat, like sprawled out. He's a big guy, too. Okay. Or he just like, yeah. yow, yow, or attacks, or it's like, no, don't, don't be fit. Right. Don't be attractive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he encouraged oh, me to, to gain the quarantine 15. <laughs> but I, I, try, yeah. I, I tried not to. <laughs> Gotta keep. Come on, I mean, keep do you, strong. Do you, yeah, you look like you're strong. I, I try. Do you I, ever? I, do you, I can. I can, so, I can only do push-ups with my knees touching the ground. Hey, I'm not mad at that. Um, but okay, so there must be p points where you can get even though with with your cat, right? No. Okay, well, like with any. Is sort it a of, he? Yeah, okay. with any sort of abusive situation, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde, where it's like. Oh, he's very sweet. Aw, he's so cuddly. Wait a minute, he's Jekyll and Hyde? He's both. He's right. Yeah, so he's both, both <laughs> faces. <laughs> is cat talk boring? No. Okay. Are you kidding? Okay, this so is... there are certain conversation topics where it can be a little dicey. Like people talking about cats, people talking about this crazy dream they had. Just like. Why, what's dicey? Meaning what mean? it can be easily boring to an audience. Well, you know what John Case. If it was Case, just you and me, I'd be like, okay, let's you know talk John, an hour. But John Case, you know what John Case says about that? He uh, says he's quiet for four minutes and. <laughs> I knew you were going right? to say that. No, he said. <laughs> well, he just quotes a Zen thing where it's like, if something's boring for, for if something's boring, listen to it for a minute. Mm -hmm. If it's still boring, listen to it for two, for four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Eventually, you find that it's not very boring. That's according to him. Oh. That's true. Is it? I watched... Um, I didn't say it's true. I, it's okay. just what he said. <laughs> I, okay, so during the time of quarantine, everyone's going live on Instagram, right? So mm -hmm. there's so much content that you could, you know, entertain yourself with. I watched this, like, one, like, rock singer sign posters yeah. for, like, 10 minutes, just kind of quietly. Yeah. And, like, at the beginning, I was like, what is this? Is this content? But then, like, two minutes in, it was like levels of consciousness like arising totally. i'm like 
oh, this is a Zen meditation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was just talking about this with my friend David Palmer, who's a, a, a really great artist in Pasadena, and he, he told me about this Sigarosa, you know Sigarosa, right? Yeah, yeah. You know that, I haven't seen this video that they made on the solstice, where they just drove around for eight hours and just live streamed it, oh, or, wow. or, or filmed it, and, and there's this whole thing in, in Scandinavia in general called slow TV, where people just like turn on their camera for a, night, at a 20 hour train journey, and people watch it. Oh. People actually do watch it. Oh. So. There is, um, <clears throat> there's like this YouTube uh, new, I don't, well, it's a trend to me because I know, of, I just learned about it a couple weeks ago, but I'm sure it's like five years old. I'm kind of late on trends, but <laughs> it's like, they have like these, um, like, scapes, like, of, like, you could be in Harry Potter's, like, fireside. Right. And then they just, you just put that on, on yeah. your screen, and it's supposed to be very calming you're transported to like Hogwarts and then you know that's yeah. probably the same but for nerds <laughs> <laughs> well I, I, I think I mean readers readers <laughs> <laughs> synonym for nerds yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I just joined the infinite jest book club so oh I which I heard you told, yes. called me a nerd as a result <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is but good I, <laughs> I don't mind that I'll wear that no but then I quickly <laughs> followed it up with fellow nerds uh, yeah nerd, yeah okay nerd well then, one beat. Cheers to that. Okay. We'll do a COVID. Let's do the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I already had it, by the way. Yeah. Well, I haven't. No, well, I'm kidding. Can you still carry? Who knows? I'm about to. Get, I'm going to get my vaccination in the next couple of weeks because I'm a teacher. Humble brag. <laughs> Here come the shots, man. All right, I like it. <laughs> um. Okay, so I love hearing about your cat. Okay. So, I mean, okay, so, but it's, uh, so interestingly, I, you know, now, I actually, do, I, and I'm not just saying this, I actually, I like Roz Chast, you know her work, yeah. in New Yorker, I think uh -huh. she's really, I think she's really quite good, mm -hmm. but I think you're better, or I like your work more, oh, I shouldn't say you. better, but, um, uh, I'm curious if you put yourself in, if you, maybe I'll ask it as a question, do you see, do you see yourself kind of in the same kind of sphere as, those, no. Some of those, you don't? No. Really? I very much think of myself as like a folk artist, like, folk an, out, like an outsider artist, uh -huh. like someone who's very local. Don't you think that term is demeaning though? Outsider? If I've come to embrace it as my own identity, then no. Okay. It is me. <laughs> no, no, right. no, 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 I understand that. Um, I think it is for people like as a category to sort of, you know, marginalize people and like well, not in integrate them into a broader like scope. Yeah. But, like, if I'm looking at these people who didn't have, like, a national effect and that they were kind of beloved in a cult way... I see. I, f I feel I, like I, I'm that. So you, you mean outsider in terms of being, like a, like, a cultural force. But do you mean that... Because outsider, the term outsider artist, from my, from in my world, is more as somebody who isn't trained formally. Yeah, I don't think I... Well, I, oh, mean, I know yeah, I know that you fit that, too, according yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, that's what I identify with. I mean... Yeah. Like, my training is, like, classical music, but the music I make now, yeah. I just feel like it's so, like, not classical music that I, yeah. that I identify more with people who see, just the, kind of... The thing, see, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm teaching, because I've thrown away all my traditional cur curriculum, and I'm, I'm, my 2D design class is only making memes. Oh, That's wow. their only assignment. And there's no materials list. Wow. But we are doing very rigorous um, compositional exercises, but they're not being graded. You're just, like, upending the system. Am I? I don't think I am. Or I, think, I don't know. I, th I think I'm leveling the playing field, man. I do not think I'm. I don't think it's radical. Anyway. Well, well, I, the, it, I've been removed from academia for like 20 years. Lucky so you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have that glow, Jen. That's why I look like an ashen-faced, dusty I professor. I live in LA. I have a doctor. I'm gonna grow moss. You know, moss covered with elbow pads. I'm just gonna have elbow patches. I'm not even gonna have the tweed jacket. I'm just. I'm gonna get an elbow pad. I'm gonna get a tweed tattoo on my yeah. elbow. <laughs> Just to remind myself not yeah. to do it. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what yeah. the, how it's progressed. So here, here's, here's the, the single notion that I call fucking bullshit on with academia. This, this, this term, mm -hmm. this quote. You have to know the rules before you can break them. Mm -hmm. Fuck that, it's bullshit. Oh, really? I think it's bullshit. Do, oh. you, think it's bu do you think it's true? Um, I think that it really sort of like re-strengthens an existing structure and I also think that what do you mean what do you mean meaning like people 
like to teach what they know. Okay. Or but do you think or the tenants? But do you think you need to know the rules before you can make something creative, make something effective? Do you think you need to know anything to be an artist? I'm not saying it doesn't help. I'm not saying I'm not saying it doesn't help to know stuff. Yeah. But do you think you need to? <sighs> well, I'm interested I, okay, in your opinion. Okay, my opinion is like for my learning curve for how I got to this point of where I can make cartoons a certain way. Yeah. I could have. I could have easily like collapsed six years into two years if I had like a good teacher. Okay. But, what, 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 okay. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What would they be? What is it that you think you needed to be taught? And what would what would you have been taught in that collapsed two years? <laughs> what what things? How to draw a bowl of rice? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. But but okay. Yeah. But but I but, mean, but you but, okay? Let's just say you can't draw a bowl of rice. Yeah. You're still a killer cartoonist. So it has not stopped you. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so you're, that argument's gone. Yeah. Let's hear another one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're you're over okay. one. Okay, something that I do feel self conscious about in like these practices are like with people who did go through the training and did go to art school sure. have the language to be able to talk about their who work. Who cares? What the, who cares? In in a way where they can be detached from it, where they can take criticism about it and say, oh, how can I improve? Like Let me I, tell ne you I never solicit like. Jim, you, if you think that you are that you, that they are more well adjusted than you, you are sadly mistaken, my friend. <laughs> I don't know. They, I do know. So composed. They they're like Dorian Gray. You know what they look like on the inside? Crumbling. Oh, <laughs> the painting in the attic is just. Yeah, I mean, I'm including myself. I okay, so, I'm and I'm not trying to have hassle you really, but I think that, I maybe you're in my opinion, you might be mistaking your own awkwardness or or insecurities that we all have with an actual fact that you don't that you lack the necessary means to do what you need to do even if you feel like you don't aren't doing what you should be doing you are doing it yeah okay I think where the imposter syndrome is I think we all suffer from it well I just think that I don't have like um, the ability to like dialogue about my work oh I see in, in a way but where, you're doing great where now. criticism is welcome and like that's sort of like part of the practice. Like I never solicit criticism. If people want to critique, like don't tell me. So what, Virginia Woolf, you know, I mean, Virginia Woolf's, I don't know if you read Virginia, she's an amazing writer. I think I read To the Lighthouse. Yeah, it's a great one. I read A Room of One's Own. Yeah, that's a great one too. I'm gonna read that, actually I'm gonna read that on my yeah. podcast. Um, Virginia Woolf was so neurotic, and she ended up killing herself by the way, you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't remember She walked that. into the water, she walked into the river with rocks. Oh, that wow. was it. But that's the end of the awakening. That's I right. Chopin. Yep, exactly. But she apparently her her psychologist or psychiatrist, whatever her doctor, forbade her to read her reviews of her oh. because it just fucked her up. I think that's a great prescription. Yes. So that's my point mm -hmm. is that it did not take anything away from her unbelievable mm -hmm. ability as a writer. Just, I, I think this idea that we're supposed to be well adjusted and like, oh, we should be able to take criticism. I'm like, fuck that, man. Like, oh, why should we? You. We're just human. Like, we, it's not fun to hear that shit. No. You know, and, and like, it, the idea that you're, and it, the idea that you can articulate yourself, okay, it's really nice to be able to do that. And yes, we can communicate. But I'm, I can tell you one thing. I understand more about your work now. And you're, you're, you're very articulate about what you're doing. Yeah, but I, I'm not asking you to criticize my work. Well, but, but see, we get along because it's all compliments. I get, I get <laughs> it's so easy. But but I, but there's but why would I even why would I want to criticize your work? Because I just think it's funny. Oh, well, that's not the mode of people. But that that's my problem with academia. Yeah. See, that's the thing is, well, I mean, I I got into this huge internet argument with this guy. In Internet's where you go. To I don't care. But I, put, I made a post that said yeah. there's no bad art, only bad viewers, mm -hmm. which I know is kind of asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, if, I, I do kind of believe it still. I do believe it, but I, it, I don't know if I believe in absolute. So I, I said it as an absolute. So that is kind of a problem with my post. Okay. But I still believe a thing about it, which is, it, it goes back to the John Cage thing. If you think you, if I kind of look at those two red pots over there, and I'm like, I think those are ugly. Mm -hmm. And like, but, so what? Somebody mm -hmm. probably finds them beautiful, number one. Yeah. And number two, I could find them beautiful mm -hmm. if I actually question myself. There's probably all these like biases mm -hmm. that might just be habits of the day. Mm -hmm. 
and, and or maybe not, maybe they're core values, but but I, I think I think that people confuse their taste with a universal judgment. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, not even a problem because it's a human thing to do, mm -hmm. but to me it just limits your experience. Like it'd be a lot more fun if you didn't do that because mm -hmm. you'd like more shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So the critic, the idea of criticism being this like necessary thing, I kind of call bullshit on that. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think I don't know why it's necessary all the time. Maybe sometimes it is. Yeah. What do you think is necessary? Do you think it's like something that's important to the advancement of culture? Because I don't think I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm questioning whether it really is. Well, I think that... Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't really know either. Maybe I don't have an answer for this. You don't have to have an answer. I don't either. It's, it's, I'm actually raising a question that I do not have the answer for yeah. myself. But... I, well, okay. <laughs> something that I do think about a lot is that, like, in regards to how people react to my work usually musically because like when I perform there's audience there and there's like exchange yeah that um just in general people like what they're already familiar with and right. you're when you present something that's something they haven't experienced before they'll they're only oh, yeah. for the most part their only model is what they've experienced before so yeah. they need to take that scaffolding and like smash it onto your stuff in order yeah. to comprehend what's going on. But I think a cool, I'm like, I was, that's really interesting you brought it up because I was just listening to the Bob Dylan live in 1966 mm -hmm. thing where he like was at Royal Albert Hall doing his, all his, you know, acoustic stuff from mm -hmm. bringing it all back home. And then he does like, like a Rolling Stone. I mean, you've seen, mm -hmm. have you seen that clip? It's that no. Scorsese film oh. where he's like, he basically was like, fuck you audience. I'm going to just, he goes play fucking loud to the mm -hmm. band right before he plays. Yeah. And he just gives it right back to him. <laughs> And it didn't hurt him at all. Yeah. He was also on a major label and supported by... I know, but I think, I think that... I don't think that matters. Maybe, maybe it does. Like, why does that matter? I just feel like if you have a team of people supporting you and you're revered in your community, that you have, like, a okay. leg up. I think you're right, but, but I could also argue with you that you have yeah. more to lose. See, I almost think that the unknown person maybe has less to lose in, in risking true. that. There is a great I mean, creativity. You know what happens yeah. to our, I mean, now we have cancel culture, mm -hmm. and the yeah, okay, so cancel culture can be about sort of like misdeeds and all mm -hmm. that stuff, but it also can be like, let's cancel Bob Dylan because, you know, I mean, I had the, a raging argument with my first wife's brother in law, who was. Okay, who is, first wife's brother. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, got it? Okay. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, about Bob Dylan, who said he really. I, he really just lost it after his first two or three acoustic albums. Mm -hmm. And he felt that artistically, he was like a Judas. Oh. That he had betrayed the true faith. What is your um, first wife's brother-in-law, Pete Seeger? No, no. But Pete Seeger is like, fuck him too, man. That guy is a self-righteous prick, man, in my opinion. No, he's yeah. not. He's a great... But I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like people... You know, that's what happened to Philip Guston. Mm -hmm. You know, when he... Just to, so the backstory on Philip Gustin is that Philip Gustin grew up in L.A. Mm -hmm. he's, he's Canadian originally, but he did these very figurative things in the mm -hmm. 30s. He was like part of the social realist. He was mm -hmm. part of the WPA. Mm -hmm. And then he became an ab, a, a second generation abstract expressionist, mm -hmm. and he kind of became part of the true faith of like, let's reinvent painting, mm -hmm. and no, you know, nothing is better than something. Mm -hmm. And then in 1968, and it took him, a, I'm oversimplifying it, he went back to his figurative roots and did this crazy ass show at the Marlboro Gallery in New York with these cartoony they really look like cartoon things mm -hmm. uh, they're like yeah Ku Klux Klan footed figures mm -hmm. but not anyway he lost John Cage never talked to, I mean he, his, his best friend Morton Feldman who was a, a composer in front of John Cage never mm -hmm. talked to him again the only person who stood up for him was William de Kooning mm -hmm. who went up to him apparently at the opening and said I don't understand what all this bullshit is about you know in the end Art is about freedom, mm -hmm. and he gave him a hug. Oh wow! And that's that's to me that's the whole point. Of, Imagine making such an impact like Stravinsky or something. But Gustin was mm -hmm. well, yeah. Well, Stravinsky, you know what happened? I mean, when he when he uh, premiered the Rite of Spring, there was a riot. Yeah. The, Can you, you imagine like theater goers? No, I, I was talking about I was talking about this on this other podcast. I'm like I'm like I can understand writing about the price of bread, but I mean seriously. <laughs> But people get it. It's like people yeah. who who kill the goalie who missed the penalty kick, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. People attach themselves. So in some ways, in a way, what we're talking about, my, I think people who are famous and have big platforms have way more to lose. Yeah. 
I agree. I don't know. I, I, I maybe to me it's all equal. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I hear what you're saying. I would love to know what that feels like. Well, right. Well, <laughs> to sure. To be famous on a big platform and to know how much to lose. Yeah. Well, I think you will. <laughs> I think you were. I, I. Well, I don't know. I can't. I can't predict that. No. Nah, okay. Um, is it almost an hour? We have. We have like, five more minutes. Okay. Perfect. Well, I mean, I. I mean, my conception of myself is. I'm. I think that I'm Anakin Skywalker, where like they got him Uh-oh. too late. <laughs> And like he has like a dark, bitter heart, <laughs> and he has great power, but it's just gonna go bad. <laughs> so yeah, but at the end, he he see. Do you re- <laughs> In the end, he's a pale, pallid wizard. Now wait a minute. Wizened head. You really don't think that about yourself, do you? You you're saying that in jest, and maybe you think that there's an aspect. I'm not sure because like when I was practicing in my twenties and like in my early thirties, I had a lot of like hope, and like I wasn't as cynical. Yeah. And now it's like with a little bit of an edge, and it's like, I mean, it's a, it's another, it's a whole new act and a whole new right. different approach to right. creation. Right. But well, I don't. I mean, I can't remember who it was. One of my teachers said there's no bad motivation for making something, mm-hmm. even, you know, like out of control bitterness and negativity. You mm-hmm. know, um, I mean, Keats, the philosopher, talks about negative capability as mm-hmm. being like this major force in the world that's positive I guess yeah there's nothing like like harnessing spite <laughs> yeah totally but you don't seem that way to me well I don't know I yeah. guess I don't know you that well but but um no I try not to harness the, all the negative stuff but I, I, it's all cat but comics it's, but I <laughs> but see I might argue that you're actually just being honest about that part of it see mm-hmm. here's the thing I suppressed my dark side mm-hmm. I couldn't face it myself and see, I was, if you think you're cynical, Jem, I can tell you, I could have taken you down with this, my pinky. We'll have another conversation with just our shadow selves. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Fido and what, do you have a name for your shadow self? No, I have a name. See, no. I named it when I was in therapy. Oh, okay. Mr. Fido, oh, which no. is an anagram, which is a, 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 a scramble of the word freedom. Oh, wow. And I got it from a 12-step word scramble thing that they passed out to like distract us at lunch, which I fucking hated. And then I was just like, wow, this is awesome. Wow, he's really like anthropomorphized into like an entity. Oh no, I have a, I've drawn pictures of him. Oh wow. Yeah? We'll start well, the well, next conversation okay. with those pictures. That sounds really good. Um, is there anything else about yourself that you would say that, that maybe is in missing from the conversation. I mean, I, there's well, a, a lot of aspects, I'm sure. But well, I hope that whoever's watching, if there's anyone watching, we <coughs> don't know the count. This, we could just be talking to each What's other. What's the count? <laughs> uh, eight. Hey, eight. <laughs> that's that's four that, times that, here. That was entertaining, that's... and that um, maybe you learned something from this exchange. Because I'm a clam. I don't really talk that much, but well, I want to thank you, Joe Brian. is a, a clam shucker. <laughs> 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 Did you ever see the Curb Your Enthusiasm episode about the shucker? No, but I love Larry David. Yeah, you got to see this one about the shucker. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, seriously, thank you so much thank for, you for, hosting. for thank you taking for the bullet. Um, I, I am seriously a, a really a genuine fan of your work. Thank and you. I would put money on you to make an impact. Uh, empty culture. pockets right here. Okay. <laughs> Let's put where um, your mouth is. <laughs> so thank you all for tuning in. Um, thank you. This is the first uh, Trees talk. Um, and obviously... I don't have a, a, a format that's regular yet, but I'm really excited to keep it going, and I'm interested to hear your guys' feedback. So yeah, let Joe know. Thank you. Yeah, let us know. Okay. Bye.